about a year and a half ago, I get a phone call, and the voice is characteristic. Dr. Corrigan. And it, he's the sort of guy that even if you haven't spoken to him in 35 years, it was like yesterday. And he says, like, well, what are you doing? Are you busy? And then all of a sudden, he laid on me the idea of the affinity group. And um, the purpose, you know, as I see it, and as my other committee members, is to sort of have sort of a bridge between the present and the past, looking into the future. So where we can work with the present faculty, which is fantastic from all the stuff I read, the, the papers, Dr. Brodowski, your whole unit, I mean, it's just excellent. And a good crop of students that really some direction is here. Healthcare is the largest field out there. Now, by training, I'm a cardiac surgeon, I retired, and now I work for Medicaid. I'm the medical director and I, you know, do all that. And all of a sudden, Medicaid's a big deal because it's a third party option, which is going to be mandated for a lot of people. So it's going to expand tremendously. And healthcare can affect many different types of uh, disciplines. And many of the students here could be many types of healthcare providers, whether they're doctors, nurses, physical therapists, physician assistants, healthcare administrators. You know, it's all out there. And I think St. Francis is pivotal with the faculty they have. And we thought maybe with some of our influence, we could help guide and get some of the students into where they can go. So I think the future looks really good. And I think with Tom's initiative and my buddies here working together and all of you who came, I think it could be very good. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I wanted to just say one little thing, which is kind of interesting. Uh, several years ago, when I got stuff from St. Francis, all of a sudden was this little model, small college of big dreams. And I thought, hmm, interesting, who thought that up? It wasn't there in 1970. But, and I looked back, and this morning as I was leaving, I left my house at 5 o'clock in Chicago, and on the refrigerator door was it, and I saw a small college of big dreams. So in between sleeping on the airplane, I was thinking, and I thought, you know, it, it, interesting, it is a place where there were big dreams. In the audience is Dr. Boyle, Jerry Boyle, who was my lab partner in 1970 in biology. I forgot who taught the class. And, doc, you know, and myself and Jerry were from simple families. And uh, I remember we had a fetal pig that stunk of formaldehyde, and we were kind of cutting it up. And he said to me, well, what kind of a blade is that? Well, Jerry had an in at a hospital, a Methodist hospital. So he got these really good scalpels, which he borrowed, and he had a bunch of blades. He says, I'll get you some. So Jerry hands me some scalpel and blades, and we have these nice things. But he and I had big dreams, and we would talk about being a doctor someday. And we'd say, yeah, we're going to do this. And Jerry hooked me up with Methodist Hospital, and we would sit around. And since we were interested, and we spoke English, and they thought we were nice, they let us do anything. We were sewing up people and everything, and we were still in college. But Jerry and I had big dreams. And I think it's very appropriate. Of course, you know, we had a great faculty. Uh, they encouraged us. And then we had great friends, and Matt and everybody, and all the professors that we had. It was great. And we all did it and became doctors one day. So I think, again, that's a very apt little motto. And I just thought I'd make a comment on it. So now for the really big thing Dr. Colon, who is our guest speaker. Uh, very briefly, Dr. Colon provided me with his uh, CV, but he gave me an abbreviated version, which was four pages long. And basically, uh, class, the class of 1962 went to Georgetown Medical School. From there then did various fellowships and residencies at the Mayo Clinic. Um, has become one of the leading pediatric hepatologists and has worked for all these years on a professor level. He ran residency programs. He's the author of nine or 10 books, over 150 articles. Uh, basically has dedicated his life to pediatric hepatology. Having some exposure to pediatric surgery for my wife, pediatrics kind of was nothing for a long time. And then in about the late 60s, there were these pioneers. In 70s, they took over. And then pediatrics became a real specialty. I mean, something, they weren't just like people divided by three. They were different people. And a true pediatrician, Dr. Boyle is a pediatric cardiologist who specializes in transplant. Uh, you know, it's a whole discipline in itself. And I've watched it from hearing the phone calls at like, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, which they ring all the time. And as you may know, your, your wife, Jerry, probably hears them all the time. The trick is to get two phones. One that has a low ring with a 
cushion on it, and pediatric people wake up right away. Cardiac surgeons sleep through anything. So I never hear half of those. But anyway, pediatrics is definitely a great field. So Dr. Colon is uh, coming from Florida to uh, give us a little talk on translational medicine, which I'd heard about, but since I knew I was going to give this talk, I kind of read about it, and I won't give a spoiler, but I think you'll find it very interesting. Uh, following his uh, presentation, we will have a small um, question and answer period, which will lead off, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Again, everybody, thank you very much for coming, and Dr. Colon, we are to be Pleasure to be back home on campus. Thank you for that kind introduction. And indeed, I hope to introduce you to a very interesting topic, translational medicine, which uh, you will find is indeed part and parcel of what we're talking about here today. What is it? It's, it's really a discipline that converts, or in a better word, translates findings in basic science into diagnostic modalities, tools, medicine, uh, procedures, policies, education. It's, it's taking the, the hardcore discoveries in the new sciences and giving them a very practical application in the field of medicine. And you don't have to be a doctor or a basic scientist. You can contribute to this whole discipline of translation of medicine if you're in a legal field, if you're in economics, so in, in a businessman. All of these are arms that are part and parcel and important to the whole evolution of uh, translational medicine, which in another phrase is health care and science affinity. I'm going to give you some examples. They're coming from a hepatologist, a gastroenterologist. So bearing that in mind, recall that in the 19th century, the whole concept of germ theory evolved flourished with an idea of both good germs and bad germs. And we learned it through what is now the iconic Petri dish invented by Julius Petri when he was working with Robert Koch at the end of the 19th century. And with the work of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, the postulates gave us a new understanding uh, of the concept of germs. There you see the great man himself, Louis Pasteur, staring into a culture jar, which the Petri dish, of course, hadn't been invented yet. And Robert Koch, on the other hand, working with the Petri dish because his associate, uh, Julius, had given it to him. But something happened. The system began to falter because it became evident to these people that even though an organism was observed in the tissue and there was a causative relationship, they couldn't culture the bug. And the Chamberlain filter provided a little bit of the answer, but it wasn't the whole thing. There was more to it. And along came a fellow in 1972 by the name of Carl Wells. Now, Carl Wells gave us a novel classification of organisms and put us into a whole new thread of how we were going to understand human disease. Now, we're here now, we're at a very, very, very basic science level. Because what he did was, he said, look, all life, I'm going to group into two, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Eukaryotic, basically, with a membrane nucleus and with organelles within the cell. And he grouped them into three groups, as you see there, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotic. And through these studies, he showed us that 80% of the biomass of the Earth is microbial. I'm going to say that one more time. I didn't get the reaction. 80% of the biomass of Earth is microbial. Teeny bugs. We're entering the world of Horton. Here's a who. He put us, humans, into the category of animalia, uh, which is neatly inserted into a eukaryon. And here you see his uh, cartoon that he put together with the classification. He very cleverly put animalia to keep us humble in between fungi and slimy molds. <laughs> the bottom line is that this classification was totally based on a genetic molecular concept. And as a result, we're now able to study bugs through a whole different process of fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting in the study, of course, of 16S uh, RNA gene sequencing. 
Why is that important? Because only about 20% of bugs can be studied by cultures. The rest have to be studied by DNA subtraction methodology. And through this method, scientists began to study, to study our entire microsomal system, looking at the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small bowel, colonic, and vaginal microflora in what it's now called the Human Microbiome Project. Now this microbiota gives us a genomic material, totally called the microbiome, which is at least 100 times the number of our own genes. Now recall that you and I have 20 to 25,000 genes. Here we have 100 times that amount within our microbiota in our bodies. And it gets a little more complex than that because for every one of these bugs, there are about 10 to 12 bacteriophages or viruses associated with this. So our genomic clock is just huge and immense, and we're just beginning to tap it. And it all happened as a result of the work and introduction by Carl Rowe. And we're beginning to see that these bugs are indeed associated through the immune system with some very, very basic disease processes. We now know that we have about 4,000 species of bugs that live within the GI tract. Right. Of those 4,000, we commonly culture about 30 or 35 of them. If we're lucky, we can culture 100. All the rest are determined by 16th ribosomal sequencing and DNA fingerprinting. We know that the majority, the far majority, fall into two big groups, bacterioidetes and firmicutes. And that will have importance a little later when we start talking about the problem of obesity. How does it all work? This is a little complex, this cartoon, but the bottom line is that we have the micro microbiota, our entire intestinal system, uh, being degraded to produce what are called uh, microbiota associated molecular patterns. These interact with the intestinal villi to stimulate the toll-like receptor and give us the so-called inflammasomes. Inflammatory mediator cells like interleukin, cytokinins. There's a huge group and a huge family of them. Currently there are at least 32 different interleukins known and of the cytokines there are hundreds that are still being evaluated. And I'm just talking about cytokines. I'm not even talking about lysosomes and other immune uh, related proteins that our body makes. The bottom line is that all of these then stimulate the T cells and program the T cells to give us the regulation of the Th1, Th2, and 17, which are intimately associated with some diseases. The immune system is affected by our microbiota, but so is uh, appetite regulation, digestion, absorption, drug metabolism, and here are just four quick examples. We know that dietary fiber is converted to short-chain fatty acids by Bacillus fragilis and Lactobacillus species. Why is that important? Because short-chain fatty acids are the favorite food of the clonocyte, particularly butyric acid. Your large bowel is healthy because it eats the butyric acid that's made by the gut bacteria. Indigestible polysaccharides are converted to absorbable monosaccharides. Um, Bacillus theta iota micron upregulates pancreatic colipase, therefore deeply affects our whole fat metabolism. And the clostridia species actually regulate the lanaric acid conjugation and the metabolism of all the xenobiotics that we're exposed to on Earth. And in this modern world, we're exposed to lots of xenobiotics. So we have a complex and profound symbiosis of the intestinal microbiome with our bodies. And we know for sure that cholelithiasis, gallstones, um, abdominal colonic carcinoma, celiac disease, liver coma, um, irritable bowel disease, uh, irritable, um, inflammatory bowel disease, familiar Mediterranean fever, et cetera, as you see listed there, we can now definitively conjugate those to intestinal bacteria and their modulation of these diseases through the immune system. But there are non-GI ones too that are becoming fascinating. We know for sure arthritis. All of us in clinical medicine have often seen reactive arthritis as a result of measles, say, right? Or as a result of a candidal infection. Um, so we know that arthritis, asthma, atopy, 
chronic fatigue syndrome, diabetes mellitus, uh, fatty liver disease, as you see listed here to include, of course, syndrome X, very important uh, syndrome currently involved arterial sclerotic heart disease and diabetes mellitus type 2, and multiple sclerosis, etc. Many more will be found in the future, but for now we're focusing on these because we have good evidence that they're indeed associated with our intestinal microsomes. So by now you're asking, all right, you're telling me about all these bugs. Um, tell me something more exacting. But I'm going to give you two, colitis and obesity. And the implication is, as I'm talking, that if we can change the microbiota, that might be the therapy. The best model studied right now is that of chronic clostridia difficile infection. Um, what you see here on top is the normal uh, colonic mucosa of the transverse colon is seen through the colonoscope. And here's a patient, you're looking at the same view, the transverse colon, here's a patient with C. difficile colitis. These are people who have not responded to any microbial therapy, including vancomycin. Probably the biggest gun that we have for clostridium. No response. However, they respond dramatically to FMT, fecal microbial transplantation. And there have been quite a few studies done, and currently we're up to over 500 cases that have been treated by um, FMT. About 75% of them through colonoscopy, and about 25% through the nasal digital tube, with an overall cure rate of over 90%. Um, no ill effects, and some of these patients are now into their fifth year of transplantation. Um, all part of this application of this basic science now to a truly controlled uh, medical therapeutic environment. It's also been used with efficacy uh, for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And it's been used in some non-GI diseases with statistical improvement well beyond the placebo effect. Right now these are mostly case reports because right? the science quite hasn't been worked out yet. The translational science hasn't been worked out yet, but it's coming. But right now there have been good case reports on Parkinson's, MS, multiple sclerosis, syndrome X in particular, uh, all of which uh, uh, deserve further study uh, in the great progress that's been made in treating these diseases. And to tantalize you, there is indeed a link with uh, autism and clostridium species. It's been found that children who are autistic have a tenfold uh, increase in the intestinal flora of gastridium, and some of these patients have responded to treatment with vancomycin. It's a very small number, but it's a tantalizing number, and it puts even more coercion into the understanding that autism may have a distinct immune mediation. So it turns out that what we in gastroenterology world we always talk about the gut-brain syndrome axis now it looks like we have to talk about the brain-gut microbiome axis. So it's for the bowel. Now what about this question of obesity? Here you see a quick little picture of a fat mouse and a skinny mouse. Um, these are GM mouse. They're not obiotic mice. Um, and the studies have been conducted predominantly with, with these mice because we can then study their intestinal microflora. Bottom line is that if you take a normal mouse in a non abiotic mouse, and you feed the normal mouse half the quantity that you're giving the not abiotic mouse, the normal mouse gets fatter by almost 50%. Why? Well, taking mice that you colonize with the microbiota from normal mice, they very rapidly conventionalize, and so they register a 60% increase in body fat. They develop insulin resistance with type within two weeks, despite the fact that they're eating the same exact thing. The only thing you've changed is the gut bacteria. You've given them the bacteroides firmicute balance from a normal mouse into a not abiotic mouse, and they get these diseases. Furthermore, when they're conventionalized, they have increased monosaccharide absorption, they have decreased the novo hepatic lipogenesis, and whatever other, they're making much more fat. 
they're absorbing much more sugar, and more importantly, they uh, have a suppression of their fat-induced adipose factor, which is a factor that controls the lipase. So that if you suppress that, you suppress lipase, and you get fatter. These and mice have an increased quant concentration of firmicutes. Lean mice have an increased concentration of bacterioidetes. And there's been a small study conducted in humans, only about 12, uh, 12 reported of these subjects that were randomly assigned to a fat-restricted diet or a carbohydrate-restricted diet, and their fecal flora was monitored for a whole year. And what was found was that regardless of the diet, their flora changed from a predominance of firmicutes to bacterioidetes when they lost weight. Is there a future when we're going to get an obese patient in a room and we're going to figure out their BMI and say, yes, you qualify, you can get one of three. You can get a band, you can get a gastric bypass, or you can take these capsules. What do you think they'll do? I'll take the capsules. So we're getting close to that. Now this has been a very short introduction to translational medicine. I have focused on bacteria in the gut because that's what I know the best. Uh, but it's going to affect many, many more disciplines and there are in the literature right now other exciting uh, instances of some very distinct basic science becoming translated into readily adaptable clinical uh, modalities of treatment. And it is, for me, a good example of what is healthcare in science of therapy. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed, prevention is, is the main key and the one that sort of the insurance industry is interested in. Because if you can prevent the whole process, uh, you can prevent the costly process down the line. In fact, more and more companies, as you know, are readily paying for preventative measures because they see the financial benefit to them through that. As far as translational medicine and basic sciences, um, we have the example was set for us a long time ago. I take you back to the Korean War and the studies that were done with American GIs during the war. Um, with basic studies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, bed rest and muscular starvation. And through some very basic observations, they found that after day six, you begin to lose about 1% of your muscle mass if you're inactive. And by day 14, that increases to 3%. So these were some very basic observations that led to a preventative modality. And you all know right now that following any procedure, they get you on your feet right away. You can have open heart surgery. You can have liver transplantation. The next day, you're sitting by the bed. By day two, they've got you standing and taking three or four steps because they found very quickly that the way to prevent further somatic deterioration of the body following any prolonged illness or surgery is to get the motion going. So that's a, a quick example of some uh, basic science adaptation on a preventative mode that will hopefully help the patient. Well, I think you picked a good example with Crohn's disease because there's no doubt that Crohn's disease is mediated by a bacterial stream. Take a patient with active Crohn's disease and you divert the fecal stream, the distal bowel heals. You reconnect the bowel, the disease comes back. So we know it's the fecal bacterial stream. Um, fecal micro uh, uh, transplantation has been used in about we're up to about 25 patients now that have been reported in the literature with Crohn's disease, and all of them have improved. About half of them have had a permanent remission. Right? By the way, the bowel, our bowels conventionalize within 24 hours. It's just remarkable. If I give you a fecal transplant now from, and I should say a spouse, by the way, there's good evidence to show that spousal fecal transplants are much more efficacious than from a foreign donor. So be kind to your spouse, because someday you may need your stool. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know the expression, don't give me any of that. Well, yes, in fact, do give it to me. I may need it someday. Uh, 
<laughs> What's good, what has to get better is, is our methodology. Because right now it's very tedious. You have to take, from the donor, you have to take 250 grams approximately of stool. That gets checked for organisms, listeriosis, clostridia, campylobacter, etc. Then they do viral studies, then they look for parasites. So it's very time consuming and costly. Finally, when they think they have, quote, a healthy stool, they take 250 grams and they mix it with about 50 mLs of non bacteriostatic saline. Okay? Swirl it up and then you filter it through gauze. You can't use a, a, a porcelain filter, you can't use a paper filter, it's got to be gauze because you need some of the particulate matter. Uh, and then it's given either through colonoscopy uh, or through an NJ tube. I'm kind of simplifying things because the fact is that in the transplantation, over 50% of the bacteria are dead. In fact, it's closer to 40% remain, and yet they work. More than that, there are bacterial organic acids that come along with the filtrate, multiple polyols. What's doing the trick? Is it the bacteria, the polyols? or the viral genome. We don't know yet. We need more translational basic science. So it's not going to come in capsule. Not going to come in capsule, not yet. But there's no data out there. You know why there's no data? Because it's not at home. Nobody's reporting it. There are no controls. Well, when they go to the emergency room, that kind of thing. You know, it, it comes across squeamishly from the patient who's sitting in front of the doctor and the doctor says, looks at the, the spouse and says, gee, you're looking so much better, you're feeling better, what have you changed? And one of the spouses says, well, we, we did a little transplant. And that's it. We have no data. Um, should it work? Sure. We know for sure that it, it works particularly between spouses. I mean, it's a, there's a dramatic, uh, something like 84% versus 40%. 84% of it's from a spouse, 40% of it's from a, a foreign donor. Do I encourage it? For the science, no. How are we going to find out unless we've got some measured, controlled studies? Um, but if you're desperate, and you know, some, I don't no longer have the picture up there, but someone with uh, chronic C. difficile is desperate. Somebody with uh, right-sided Crohn's disease is very desperate. The pain is intolerable, and if they can get improvement by getting some of their spouses Intestinal bacteria, who am I to criticize? Yeah, they'll use a, a, a family relative, and there have been quite a, to my, to my knowledge, the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology, the last report uh, for children, there have been about at least 25 reported cases, all efficacious. I mean, it's pretty benign uh, when, you, when you stop to think about it, because um, you have all your natural intestinal defenses there to begin with. So it, it's a good course to take with kids uh, who have not responded to any other modality of treatment. I mean, I think, I think to my days of the kids that came in with pancolitis, who after working with them for a year, I just gave up and I would knock on the door of my fellow surgeon and say, Greg, it's time, this kid needs a colectomy. And we're talking about, I mean, it's awful to have a colectomy done at eight or nine years of age. It's bad enough as an adult, uh, but as a kid. Then came along cyclosporin. Well, now only about half of the kids had to go for a colectomy. And now with the fecal transplant, I'm hoping that zero will have to go to a colectomy. The answer to that, you've got several questions there. Yeah. Uh, the, the, first, the first one I can tell you is that in terms of uh, the street of difficile, um, the longest patient out now is um, the, one, the longest patients are the ones that were done in 1958. They're, they're no longer with us. They're long gone. But they remain disease, all four of them remain disease free for the duration of their lifetime. And the patients we're seeing now who are still with us or who are now been followed for four to five years have remained disease free. How does that compare to the patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Those patients have had remissions and slowly, gradually, the diseases reappeared. But not as aggressively as when they were first treated. 
So there's got to be a little tweaking, a little fine-tuning that will go on there. And I think that for a large cohort of these patients, there will be an improvement. What was your third question? Your uh, last the association question. of human physiology oh, with hormones. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. The, the main gut hormones that we're looking at, of course, are uh, um, gastrin, uh, bombesin, and motilin. Those are the three main intestinal gut hormones that, that affect the motility of our bowel. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. Only, only by speculation, because when you're talking about epigenetics, you're really talking about uh, telomere methylation and DNA methylation of telomere. And I, I don't know how that would interact vis-a-vis -vis the immune system. We don't know that yet. I, I can give you A. Premise A, the gut definitely associates our immune system. I can give you premise B, that DNA methylation, that the epigenetics of DNA methylation of the telomere affects not only cellular longevity, but it affects disease processing. But I can't give you C, how they're related. I, I, it's been my experience that the way to generate interest among the students with it is to have little weekly or monthly, depending on how it fits into the curriculum. Journal club means where you assign a paper to a student that touches on what you may be covering in class right now. Let's say um, you're doing anatomy uh, and you're doing the lymphatic system, as an example. Um, and I would assign a current hot topic paper now for the lymphatics, which is the use of modulated HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, modulated to be non-transmissible, but used as a vector, a gene transfer vector, into the T cells of sick patients. All done through a lymphatic process. You cover all bases. And that would be one way to, so you assign that paper to a student, have the student come in and, quote, translate the paper to the class, I bet you that would generate a lot of discussion. So I like to use the, the, the journal club format at a certain level. Oh, it certainly is. There's no doubt about that. And But you're opening up here a whole can of worms. Yeah. Uh, That's me. You know, <laughs> the, the top layer, of course, being legal. This is America. Mm -hmm. Okay? Where uh, the word uh, al, al su is learned with both mama and papa. Um, and... Physicians very often react because um, they feel that the patient expects them to do everything. You mentioned um, penicillin, one of my favorite examples that I use with the students. Um, the first applications in 1943 after uh, Lewis and Kahn finished their practical extraction caused uh, um, the the extraction and purification of penicillin wasn't really practical until 43. And they started giving it to soldiers uh, who had pneumonias, regarding pneumonias. Um, and at the time, streptococcal pneumonia was treated with one dose of five milligrams of penicillin. Single dose. You know what we're up to now? 14 days of three to five million a day. The bugs are smart. They're getting smarter. They've learned to get around it. Um, not, not even to mention MRSA or the other things. Uh, but yes, it, it's, being, it's being overused. Um, but the answer is very complex as to how uh, invasive and how aggressive the physicians are. And, and the clinical setting, too, and, and the comfort you feel. I can tell you that um, as a young pediatrician when I was still on the ward and assigned to the, the, the preemie unit, I would, uh, at the time I would not hesitate to turn off the oxygen on a baby that was 1,200 grams. I just knew. Now of course we think nothing of salvaging a 500 gram baby. That's a 500 gram baby. That's, my wish star rats that I worked with were seven and 800 grams. Right? You've got babies now that are 450, 500 grams, and they're dramatically working with them. I'm not sure they're producing good citizens, by the way. 
in fact, there's good strong evidence to show that at 500 grams, uh, 5 to 700 grams, about 70% of these babies by the second year will demonstrate neurological deficits. So I'm not sure we're doing the right thing, but that's another topic. And I'm going to step on toes if I continue.